All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another interview with the artist. That's right. We're back. It's a new season. It's a new world. It's new questions and new artists I'm talking to. And I am very, very excited to talk to the artist today. Mamacon, how you doing, sir? It is so good to talk to you. You and I met in person for the first time like two weeks ago, and instantly I was like, this is somebody I like. I I was like, you're this is my guy. I got to interview this guy. So how you doing today, sir? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, thank you very much for this introduction, Vince. And I uh, also want to say I had the same feeling towards you. <laughs> so it's a, <laughs> it's a, you know, bromance that probably will go a long way, hopefully. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, like right away, it was so funny because we, you know, we met kind of just hovering around the Golden Demon cases. We went in adept, at AdeptCon in Chicago. We were talking about the various entries as you do with the other artists. If people don't go, I highly recommend it. It's a great place to just hang out and talk to people. And I'm walking around and I'm like, yeah, I really like this one. I really like this one. And Mamacon was like, yeah, yeah, I, I painted that one. I painted that one. I was like, oh my God, these are my picks. Like you were so many of my hot picks. Okay. One of which I have up right now, this beautiful Chaos Warrior unit. This was a hot pick um, in from, from my list. Uh, so... Uh, sir, it is an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Um, you are an artist of, of uh, that I've been following for a long time on the socials, and so it was great to actually like put the face officially like in person with the name. All right, so we're going to start out at the beginning, basically. Like that's where we generally start these interviews. I'm going to we're going to use a slightly different format of questions this time. It's a new season, it's a new world. We're going to change it up some, but. Some questions are still important. Like, for example, how'd you get into the hobby? Like, how did you get into miniature painting? This is a weird thing we all decided to do, right? We all have to be a little weird to decide to paint tiny plastic people. So how, how'd you get into this? Well, uh, my journey starts when I was a little kid. Um, it was actually my older brother that got me into this. He was already three to four years into the hobby when, when I started liking it um and the final kind of piece in the puzzle for me that made me go across the the border and start uh, really liking this was the lord of the rings and the miniatures that came with it um i remember my mom passing me a uh, a journal with some uh, i think moria goblins and and uh, paints that uh she and my uh, brother got me and I started, you know, clipping them off the, of the sprue, painting them. And I was like, this is the best thing ever. <laughs> um, then a year later, uh, I started really liking this even more because um, on a one sunny day, my bro uh, brought a, uh, I don't know if you've seen them, the, uh, back in 2001 or two, they introduced a magazine and the white dwarf like an addition to the white dwarf that was okay. uh, white covered uh journal with all of the golden demon winners from the past year so my uh, brother br brought this uh journal with 2003 i think winners and uh we just we were amazed with everything that was in it right uh so many amazing pieces uh one of them was a uh unit of um Chaos uh, Mounted Warriors uh, that won the Slayer Sword in the UK in 2003 by uh, Jakub uh, Rune Nielsen. Uh, I actually I remember was... this piece. It was a real, those were really cool Chaos Warriors. I know, I, or Chaos Knights or whatever, yes. I remember exactly what you're talking about, yes. Yeah, and um, by the way, my brother is also an, well, I, I don't want to say also, but he's an amazing artist. He used to sculpt amazing miniatures back when he uh put could put a lot of time into into the hobby um and uh if you remember that year that there, there also was a dragon i think it might be a sculpted dragon and he actually copied that the miniature exactly and that was his first sculpt and i thought okay one day we have to make him a sculpt and i'll paint and we try to win a demon a power but, combo <laughs> right there yeah exactly that that would be that that is a you know bucket list thing that that I still want to do hopefully one day if he has time to, to to do it, uh, maybe the community can put him under pressure and 
start messaging him or something. Let's let's figure this out later. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Absolutely. I mean, look, we saw like, you know, the the custom sculpted uh Mephison or whatever this year, right? So like it's 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 in. Like let's make this happen. I love the idea. That's great. Yeah, that that would be something special for sure. Um and yeah, just kind of got more and more I just kind of got more and more into this uh, as the years passed on um, you know there was the usual as you call it the break when you when you uh, figure out that there are girls in, in, sure. in the world <laughs> sure. and you start uh, being afraid that someone will know that you're into miniatures and then you know back in I don't know 2007 it wasn't that popular it was a big hobby and it was you know very very nice and, and cool and everything but sometimes you could still get those uh oh you're into miniatures that's kids toys and sure when you're I don't know, 13 14 you're like okay i have nothing to do with this um so yeah um i had a uh break from from this but i still uh still really liked the, the miniatures i always uh saw the new releases and i thought one day i'll come back to this i will put my effort effort into this and, and the time um but that was that was the part where i just enjoyed playing the, the game as well um but one day uh, I, I was terrible at playing uh, the actual game um and i uh the curse of always, the of the hobbyist and painter yes is being exactly, also like yeah. you play the game but you're bad at it yeah I always rolled once, except for the times where I had to roll leadership. Sure, so then it it's pretty, just straight sixes all the way down. The, yeah, absolutely. Like the classic, yeah. Uh, so I thought maybe I will just stick to painting for now. Um, but yeah, that, that was the beginning. Um, and See, uh, this is where I was lucky, because I met my wife actually before I started playing Warhammer. Okay, or or became involved with miniatures in any way. I was already a mega nerd in like five other ways, so she she knew what she was in for. But after I met her, I got into Warhammer because I was like I met her when I was like sixteen, and then when I was eighteen, I think I got into Warhammer. So at any rate, she she knew what she's in for the whole time. So I was lucky there. See, I didn't have to didn't have to ever like have that 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 kind of gap period. But it's not unusual. I also never had an older brother. I'm the eldest child. So I was cursed. A lot of people I talked to, their older their older siblings get them into it. I could have been into it years earlier. Could have been way ahead of where I was, but no. <laughs> no older sibling. So you 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 had your gap years, you got back into it, um, focusing up on the hobby side. I have a question for you. What it was originally Lord of the Rings. Have you always been a fantasy guy? Did you get drawn back in? Like, did you eventually go over to the sci-fi side as well? Like what part of it holds more of your heart or your interest or, or is it both i would say it's definitely 40k uh because my favorite army is space wolves um and that's also very tightly connected to my brother because when i was a little kid usually the kids get stories about you know fairy tales and and knights and you know whatever castles and i got stories from the I think third edition Space Wolf Codex about Space Wolves. <laughs> uh, and it was amazing because I, I, you know, I had dreams when I was, I don't know, nine or eight about uh, becoming a Space Wolf. And I thought, this is so cool. This is the coolest universe ever. Um, so I actually, I'm, I'm more um, drawn into 40K. I really like the fantasy world as well. But I would say, in my heart, it's 70 to 30% uh, towards the, the, the 40K. But Lord of the Rings is more about, I think, the the movies as well for me. Sure. I, I could rewatch them unlimited amount of times. I've maybe of watched every single episode 500 plus times. It's I know it's pretty crazy, but uh, it's just an amazing movie. And every time I watch it as well, I uh, the, the movies, I always get my painting mojo as well so i can paint better and more um so yeah nice nice it's funny because when i started playing it was during so i started playing with fantasy but i also quite very quickly got into third edition 40k and i hated space wolves i hated them so much and i still i still hold that anger and resentment to this day only because their book was so good 
at that time, and they were so strong. And, and the player in my group who played Space Wolves would just kick the crap out of all of us. And so... <laughs> You just like, you know what I mean? It's like a learned hatred. Like there's nothing actually bad about it. It's a cool aesthetic. But no, nope. I just forever hate them because they beat up on me when I was when I first started playing the game. So there there you go. Um all right, awesome. So you're you're painting, you're hobbying. Obviously you have these memories of the uh you know, of the golden demon uh sort of winners that were you know in that in that magazine and that pop out. I wish they would do, by the way, more books with Golden Demon stuff, like printed material with really nice pictures, like what kind of Golden Demon compendium put together, what Matt, you know, put together. But I'd love to see them do coffee table books and, you know, just stuff like that. I think it'd be real. I'd, I'd certainly pick those up. I just love a collection of like some of the coolest entries over the years. Right. And like you, you could imagine the sections. But anyways. There's an idea, GW. Make it happen. Let's go. It's just another book. We'll all, we'll all give you money. Just find these pieces. You got to have pictures of them somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yes, thank you, Manzac. True grit was OP. I agree. That's exactly right. That is exactly it. They could use full size bolters in one hand. All right. I don't want to get into it. I don't want to get, I'm not going to revisit third edition 40 K. It's very upsetting to me. <laughs> Anyways, just bring it up. Just opening old wounds there. Okay. So when did you decide Hey, I want to start doing some competition painting. You know, I want to move beyond. What motivated you to that step and and how did you get there? What was the, you know, what were you doing? What was your method of improvement? Well, this is a a question towards uh I have an answer with two two kind of smaller answers within it because I think I always had a good understanding of actually where I am because sometimes people think okay I'm now good at painting so I will win a slayer sword tomorrow when they are 13 and I always knew that okay now I'm good for young bloods but not for the top competition for you know the seniors sure so I always knew that you know I'm I'm pretty good but um, I cannot compete with the you know top painters so I really wanted to win a golden demon and uh, in 2008, I uh, uh, had the opportunity to visit the, the Golden Demon in Poland, in Poznań. And uh, I prepared an entry. Um, I went there again with my brother and I was uh, lucky enough to win a silver. Uh, but there were three entries, so at least I wasn't, <laughs> I don't want to offend the, the guy that was in, in the bronze, but at least I bit, you know, I was. Yeah, sure. The, no, absolutely. Place. No, I, I'm just kidding. But um, that was an amazing achievement to me because uh, I actually took part in some, you know, local store competition uh, stuff and I never placed. Uh, and I really wanted to to have this uh, at least young lots achievement in, in my books. Um and that was amazing. I also met uh, Ben Comments and many top painters like uh, uh, Borja uh, Garcia. Hopefully, I, I didn't slur the, the, the name. Uh, oh, this Pedro. channel is all about mispronouncing things, so don't okay. worry. You're, you're fine. Okay. You're then, fine. then after my surname, you can uh, say, hey, Macarena, because it's pretty complicated. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I met some amazing painters. So it was just the best day probably of my childhood. Then I, I had the break, and then I came back, painted uh, just for myself, then some commissions, and then I thought maybe I can do better just for, you know, at that time, just so I can earn more money and paint better uh, commission level uh, stuff. And so I, I tried to improve. But I think at that time I was still pretty tabletop level um so it was nothing special then i think it was 2016 when i thought this time i will actually put my effort into this i prepared four entries went to nottingham and uh got i think two finalists uh, for four entries and that was pretty good to me but i at that time thought maybe i could get a bronzer cure there so i was already trying my best to to win so it was first the push of trying to actually just earn more money with the commissions. Sure. If I'm honest. Um, and then I thought maybe I have a, you know, 
I have a chance to to get back into this competition after a big break and uh, start actually compete competing on the top level again. Um, Did you find so? So you were doing commission painting. Did you find that commission was helpful or a hindrance to your improvement? Um, it was absolutely helpful because again, uh, when you're uh, there, there comes a, a moment in your life when you're a commission painter when you depend on the money or you, you know, you want to just earn more money, so you start trying better or painting more miniatures. And for me, it was only always uh better to paint less miniatures to to a better standard so i always wanted to have commissions for hqs and you know um characters and everything like that so i can paint less miniatures and you know with a big bigger time frame to a better standard just because i really like to put more effort into miniatures sure and it always hurt me to 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 paint squads of uh that's why i don't have an army painted because i i cannot paint uh, miniatures not to my perfect level to my perfect level so i understand so somebody yeah. just throwing 40 space marines in front of you and being like no no i just want these done that's a nightmare situation for you absolutely i had this amazing commission of a full army of orcs uh fantasy orcs and it was amazing money but it was 300 miniatures and i sat on it for three months and then i said sorry here's our money back i, I will not paint i cannot paint this just because i couldn't start the even the first miniature because i knew there was 299 more wow yeah that's i i still army paint but over time i've certainly come to love smaller more elite armies you know uh, like I think the happiest I've been painting an army recently is when I did my Sons of Badmont for AOS because that's uh that's like six miniatures. I'm like, great, I can do this. I can do six miniatures. That's that's an army right there. Now we're talking, right? That's that's exactly the the kind of that's exactly the kind of investment I'm looking for right here. Um, it's just you're just basically painting like six display figs, right? Because they all just feel like you're doing large scale figs effectively because they're just big humans, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, cool. Yeah, I, it's always interesting because I think about commission painting. A lot of people, um, it, it's often a way to get drawn in. But I, all, I often wonder, like, can it become a distraction on the road to improvement if it's if you are just focusing purely on speed, right, and trying to turn things around, and you kind of lose the 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 vision of deliberate practice? If it's just like, not nope, going to keep applying the same techniques over and over again to just rip through these. Right. I, I, I wonder if it can end up being a distraction. So that's interesting. OK, I, I one just just a tiny thing on this. Absolutely, it can, because it's very similar to um, there's there's a lot of stories about people having dreams and then spending times th th their, their lives and, and time in, in the office just because they got a promotion and they just kind of left their dreams to, you know, go away, but right. focused on, on their day job. And this is the exact the exact same thing. If you focus on the commissions too much, you get uh, good at the commissions, then you're, you, you have a possibility of losing the sight of what's actually uh, your way to improve because you just, you're comfortable with, uh, this, you know, this sort of money and you just paint to the same level for 20 years and, and you never improve, which right. is fine for, for, for some people. But for me, it always was, uh, you know, the case of improving at some point at least. So, yeah. Nope. Makes perfect sense. Um, <laughs> uh, Grace here had said Skaven are known for their eliteness. Well, yeah, I, I look my, <laughs> cause I'm also a huge Skaven fan and you're not wrong. Grace here. If, if we end up getting new sculpts, this year for for Skaven, um, with the alleged Skaven book that's on the horizon, I'm going to be put in a really tough spot. Uh, that's going to be I'm going to have to compromise my values, I guess, for the Horned Rat. That's that's what it's going to come down to. Okay, so that was your results of your first Golden Demon, and, and here's I want to talk about something with with competition here, okay? Because you went there this 2016 GD, right? It wasn't really perhaps the results you were hoping for. Okay. I will also say, by the way, 2016 was the first year I went to a painting competition as well. So that's interesting. Uh, interesting alignment there. Um, 
and wasn't I didn't get my my results didn't turn out how I was hoping you such as life. Um, how did that like? How did you respond from that? Did you see that as like okay? Now I know where I am. I need to you know keep pushing. Did you get to talk to the judges at all? Did they give you feedback? Like what was your response after that initial hit? Um, I want to be honest, it wasn't great. Um, as in, I, I went to the judges and asked for the feedback and it was absolutely fair. And I saw that the, the better pieces won, so I had no problem with that. Yep. But, um, you know, even if you're a humble person, uh, I'm not the, the, the most humble person in the world, but I try to be humble. And even when you know that you... Uh, lo you lose fair and square, you still feel the the sadness. It doesn't doesn't matter if you didn't win because you you were not better. And I was, if I'm honest, I, I didn't feel that good after the, the, the competition. I took a break for a year, I think, and then I came back, did some more commission painting, and then by the end of 2017, I thought, okay, let's give it one more go. So I started preparing again, um, and uh, that time it was a, a little bit better. And as we talked before the show, again, the, the last minute piece won me the, the, the Golden Demon and the, uh, everything else that uh, I did not uh, expect to lose with got me nothing. So sure. it, was, it was pretty funny as well. Every time. Every time. It's always the last minute piece. You know, I try to be responsible. I start working like a year ahead. Like I started working on, on this last one in like May 2019. But all the ones I did up toward the end, that was the stuff. That was the stuff. It's always whatever you do last minute. I don't encourage people to do that. Like take your time. But it's always the last minute thing. Okay. Well, awesome. That's great. So then you, you were there. Obviously, as we can see in the halo above your head, You've had more success since then, as we can see the uh, the trophies over top of you there. Um, and I, so at this point, we've been talking a lot about, you know, what do I want to call it? I don't I want to say gaming miniatures, but that almost sounds like I'm being dismissive. I don't I'm not dismissive at all. I love painting 28 millimeter, 32 millimeter, whatever, like traditional gaming miniatures. There's nothing I see. No, it's not as though like, oh, that's lesser art than doing a bust or a different scale or something like that. That's that's nonsense. They're all just different. But I know you paint beyond just sort of gaming miniatures. So when did that happen? Did you Was that always there in the background? Did you say, hey, I want to try some other scales, some other things? Like, where did that also integrate into your journey there? Um, I don't know if this is common or not, but I'm... Well, I was a, a very... Um, orthodox Games Workshop painter. So I really liked the, the miniatures by GW because they were they were in my life since I was a little kid, since I can remember, actually. So um, I almost always painted just the GW miniatures. Uh, then, you know, I, I was aware of amazing miniatures created by uh, other companies as well. But I thought there's so many GW miniatures I want to paint in the first place. I, I don't have the time to paint anything else. But then, you know, um, uh, some of the busts got, got the better of me, like the um, bust by uh, Karol Rudik, uh, I think. Um, he, he does some amazing sculpting and, and uh, I was really drawn into, into that as well. And I thought, okay, let's give this a go because at that time it was starting getting more and more popular to paint busts as well yep so i thought let, let's give it a go and actually what brought me into uh non-gw miniatures was um the fact that uh sometimes I, I get comments okay you you paint good gw miniatures but have you ever tried painting something bigger something in a different scale uh, so I kind of wanted to prove some people as well that I can paint something bigger and, and something more um, more into, I would say, fantasy world as well. Um, so I just started picking some some uh, some different miniatures, and it was actually very 
interesting to me. I really like the experience. Uh, I'm looking forward to painting more of these now as well uh, with some amazing competitions in the future, uh, like the uh, World Miniature Expo, I think it's called, yep. uh, in, in July. Uh, this thing is happening once in three or four years, so I might as well go and, and just just to see the, the, the level and just to see the amazing miniatures. Um, so th that was that was my beginning of the journey in 2020, I think, with different miniatures. Nice. Yeah, it's funny because I think World Miniature Expo is it's, it's supposed to be every four years. And the last this will actually be five years on for this one because they canceled it last year and moved it forward a year because it was 2017 was the last one here in the U.S., I believe. And now it's oh. over uh, uh, over near you. So there you go. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to see what's there, what people have been, you know, are going to bring to this. It's it's. Uh, I'm probably, I'm sure, not going to have a chance to go over for it, but man, it would be really great. I, I don't, I'm sure I'll be old and dead by the time it comes back to the U.S., but, but one can only hope. So where do you see yourself now and where, where do you want to go in the future, right? Like, as you sit here now, you're an accomplished painter. You've won lots of awards. Oh, there you go. Every three years. Thank you, Andrew. Um, all right, so you know, what, what's your goals at this point? Like, I think for a lot of people, they feel like they probably look at the stuff you paint and say, I just want to be able to paint something like that. And the idea that there's still a world beyond that is, is sort of tough to imagine. So what's your world beyond that? Like, where are you going from here? What do you want to focus on? What do you see your journey as from this point? Um... When I just started uh, wanting to compete in the competitions, uh, I asked the, the senior painters that are on the stage for many years for advice. And some of the advice, uh, well, so, uh, all of them almost gave me the, the, the piece of advice to always search for a better painter and look up to them and try to copy their work if you like their work just so you can kind of acquire their skills by copying their work. So I, I think no matter, almost no matter who you are, there might be a few, few exemptions, there's always someone better than you. And I have hundreds of painters that I look up to, and I think these guys are just killing it. And probably if I would uh, become a full-time painter, I could uh, become like them quicker, but this is not the, the the path for me but um at this moment in time i want to uh start painting more realistically I, i've done it a couple of times on, on some of my pieces but i usually stick to the very clean everything edge highlighted uh kind of style with with sure. my uh, miniatures <clears throat> just because as we discussed before i'm a perfectionist so i cannot live with some surface not highlighted, not shaded, not edge highlighted and stuff like that. But I really want to move forward to something more, let's say, um, looking like the classic paintings by some artists from the Middle Ages. And and, and uh, I really like the, the art of a few classic painters. So I'm, I'm looking towards better painters than me in, in, in miniature painting and also to amazing historic painters like uh, Velasquez, and, and I think that that is my favorite, but to many, many others um, that have their paintings in the museums. So sure. I, I really want to go to, to uh, towards that direction, and I really want to start painting uh, different kinds of miniatures as well. Um, I still have my, my favorite aesthetic of, of miniatures, uh, something quite similar to the GW IP, but not by GW. So there, there's there's stuff in in the, in the works at the moment that I'm I'm working on that I'll hopefully be able to show within, within the coming months. So you see what what I was talking about. Nice. All right. I love it. Good teaser. Good teaser. All right. So with that, I think we should move over and actually start talking about you know, kind of your work. Let's look, I've got, I've had one up the whole time. 
which is you took silver at the most recent uh, Golden Demon here in the U.S. Uh, with this Chaos Warrior unit, uh, which is great. I love this unit. This was, as I mentioned to you as we were walking around originally, I thought this was a very strong uh, entry. Uh, that, you know, like before any, before they had put up any of the judging, I had kind of picked this one as one of my, one of my top picks from the category, but then, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about this one and then we're going to jump into some other pieces. So this thing coming together, cause this is a nice mix of the different sculpts as well. Um, so with the vampire, um, this is the, the one I was talking about, the Karo Rudik, uh, sculpt. So this this piece is just an amazing sculpt it's amazing to paint because it has so many textures and uh, i was really inspired well not inspired i almost tried to copy uh one of the best if not the best painter in the world no offense to anyone else but kirill kanaev uh, yeah sure no i mean it's i don't think i don't think that's a surprise he just he just is <laughs> yeah just incredible painting um so i was i wanted to copy his work with a slight uh, variation in the tones and the colors um, to see how he paints and to understand how he approaches uh, lighting, OSL, non-metallic, and everything like that. But this piece I tried to do within two or three days, so I didn't have the time, uh, enough time to, to put into this that I would ideally like to have. I would probably spend a month on it at least. Um, so again, this was the, the classic case of copying someone else's work almost precisely to make sure that, uh, you understand how they work and then use that, uh, that skill on some of your other pieces. And, um, I really tried to, to, um, showcase to the community as well a little bit that I can paint in a different style because... As I said before, I had a ton of comments throughout the years saying, hey, try something different than the heavy metal style. Try something more complex or basically different. So I really wanted to prove to people that I can paint uh, in a different manner. And I'm very happy with this piece. Uh, I still have not um, put it out on a proper show. So maybe I, I will bring it to um, the competition in July. Um, but I can paint a lot better now because that was almost what two or three years ago now. So, um, I, I still like this piece, but I think I can do better now. No, that's, isn't that always the case? You like every piece you create until you're done with it and then you hate it. Cause you know, like that's, that's the journey, <laughs> right? Of the, of the artist, of the miniature painter. Cause it's like, everything is your favorite piece until you're done with it. And then it's like, oh no, this is, this is terrible. But, but the next thing I do, this is going to be the one, right? Exactly. Um, so what I really like about this, somebody asked, by the way, let's real quick, go back to this. Somebody asked about your chaos warriors. Were they modified at all? And I don't think they were, right? You just mixed them because you used some of the ones out of the Underworld's Warband and then some of the normal Chaos Warriors. Am I right there? Not exactly. So okay. I really like to convert all of my miniatures, almost all of them, just so they are more special. And that is something you can see also in many past Golden Demon winners. They, they try to make their miniatures stand out by converting them as well as painting them well. So... Um, I converted, I think, all of them except for the familiar, uh, okay. for the tiny demon. Um, the, the lady is a the, the Holga miniature, the limited edition yep. uh, lady the mace. Um, and the other three are uh, just slaves to darkness or whatever they're called right now. Uh, miniatures with, with some slight variation with the um, swords, with the axes. And I actually took them from the old Chaos Warriors kit. Gotcha. Um, but I really like the new sculpts of the, these miniatures by uh, Maxime Corbel, I think. I might uh, might have already slaughtered a few names now. Um, he's a sculptor for uh, GW, and he's, he's just this amazing sculpt. So I really recommend checking his work out. Nice. All right, back to the vampire. What I uh, what I love about this is it really I really can see you exploring 
you know, a different style here. Um, it feels much more painterly. And it's also the, the way you're using color tones is really nice. Like you're integrating the this this thing that I think has become that I see people do, but it's it's it still isn't really super common. It, but it's become something that I notice as like a hallmark of uh, what I see as good paint jobs. And it's the soft integration of like yellow, yellow ochre into the near soft light. So like around the vampire, around the light spot you've gathered on his head, on the shoulder plate of the armor, you know, so on and so forth. There's this soft infusion of these other hues, right? Um, these it, like it's not obviously this guy has this sort of blue green skin, but then we're infusing this nice yellow tone in there just so ever subtly around the highlights and it ends up being a really nice counter that still keeps just a little bit of warmth there on that side when we've got all that heavy warmth on the other with the red right so it doesn't just feel like it's completely cold and completely warm um the light feels much more natural much more organic uh and you know this the the style of this like picking out a lot of the textures of the rough brush steel on the armor of the texture on the cloak as you said, bringing forth all that amazing texture that he sculpts into the skin. I just think he did a really nice job sort of gathering all that up and really bringing it to life. Thank you. Well, yeah, you... you um, I think you have to approach every paint job with an idea of what is happening around it. And I, I won't take credit for any of this because, as I said, uh, there was, this was a, almost a copy of Kirill's work. But um, I would still place the the, the colors and, and the lighting in the same place as if, if I would do it probably. Um, and I would say you also have to remember that it's it's very nice to work with the stronger um, stronger uh, places of the miniature. You have to highlight them more, as in if there's a very nice detail, if there's something that should be popping, make it pop. If something has to bring more attention to itself, do do your best to, to bring the attention towards that pe towards that um, thing. Considering the the lighting with the yellows, I really like to incorporate the the, the yellow towards my non-metallics as well because I think when you have a piece that is supposed to, supposedly standing uh, with uh, outside and it has some some lighting from say the sun. The sure. sun usually gives you the, this very bright, almost white color, but it can have some yellow to it as well, and it brings more life, more interest to the to the uh, non-metallic. So I really like to um, uh, add some of, uh, of yellows, reds uh, to my uh, non-metallics, especially when you're doing a, a sort of a. Um, uh, glimpse of, of the light that is reflected from from the the, the most light uh area of the of the sort let's say so right right this is this is something i actually i'm very happy that you spotted it so it's very cool <laughs> very good awesome yeah man it's a really great piece like i i really like this a lot and uh i i can't wait to see you do you know more of these busts is there any is there any one in particular right now you're really excited about any any one that you've got your eye on that you want to get into as far as from there's, a bust think goes there's too many but i have a piece <laughs> that is uh, a custom sculpt that i've ordered so it's a uh, no one will have it ever except for me probably I, i'm not planning to sell it afterwards so this was this will be a completely unique piece, um, and I will paint it with the same kind of idea as with this one. But I'll have to figure out everything on my own because no one else has painted this before. Sure, yeah, yeah. So that will be a very interesting um, journey, hopefully as well. So uh, adding more to the hype of, of this project, but I don't want to hype it too much. I, I just hope it, it will be fun to paint and good to look at after i finish it nice uh you say that now that you're not gonna you're not gonna have it on offer but see what happens if you do a really uh great job with the uh uh with the piece and then uh uh and then all of a sudden you got a hundred people 
um, coming to you wanting to see, hey, where can I get this thing? Where can I get this thing? Where can I get this thing? Uh, all of a sudden, you might find yourself in a different place. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> that is very true. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's keep moving. All right. Next piece is your Drazar. Uh, so Drazar, obviously, this is a, a heck of a sculpt. Uh, you know, obviously, from the the this guy's relatively new. Um, and I know that a lot of people really loved the sculpt. Um, he is a classic. Uh, so, and this was a really, really, really dynamic, fantastic update on this piece. Um, I'm just going to say a couple things I really like about it, of what, of how you handled it here, um, right off the, the top, right off the rip. First of all, the little touch of the blood splatter is so good on the, on the lead sword. I don't know what his weapons are called because I don't know. I don't know dark elf, space elf things. Um, they're another army that I don't like very much, given past history. Um, <laughs> but I just got beat up a lot. I was playing Imperial Guard in third edition. I don't know what to tell you. So, okay. um, anyways, the but like that blood splatter is really masterfully executed because you're pulling back these blood tendrils off of that splatter that are so small and thin and organic, and it really feels like. Like a Dexter episode over here, the way you 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 manipulated that blood. I just I really like it. It's the smallest touch, but it's really impactful to the overall piece. The other thing I love is how you've gathered the light around his head. So like your the way you've handled the non-metallics on his shoulder pads and then the light on his horns, all of it is serving as a halo around the center of the focal point of the miniature. Right, but it's keeping me moving. So I'm gathering this light around this shoulder, this shoulder, this horn, this horn, and then his obviously brighter face. Right. So we've got these multiple rings happening of like light, dark, light, dark, and then light on the outside with the blades. And it creates this really nice concentric ring of the light, dark, light, dark pattern um, that I think just really, really sells for me. So tell us a little about a little bit about Drazar, what you're hoping to accomplish with him. What like why do you like Drazar? Was this just like, oh, he's a good piece for competition? Do you have a love for this dude in general? Where, where are you at with him? What, tell me the story of this guy. So first of all, I want to say that uh, I can clearly see that you have a very good understanding of how painting works because uh, <laughs> you've spotted me trying to put all of the lighting around his head. So everything uh, brings you towards his face. And I think this is very important when you're working on any piece that has a focal point, and usually it's the head, if that's a human or, you know, a humanoid uh, thingy. So, um, yeah, I really try to push all the brightest points towards the towards the face. Um, this miniature is probably one of the hardest miniatures I've ever painted, not because it's very hard to paint, it's very nice to paint, but because I wanted to make sure that this is the best paint job I've ever done. And I think that was the best paint job I've ever done at that time. So I've probably invested 200 or 220, uh, 250 hours into, into this miniature. I really try to take my time with everything I, I've done on this. Um, the blood splatter was something I was very nervous uh, uh, to, to add because on, on my past projects, I was very, um, very happy to add a ton of blood and, and make the blood splatter on the whole miniature. Sure. But with this piece, I wanted to make it, you know, there, but not straight in your face. Uh, and it was also very nerve wracking because each side of the blade took me around six hours to blend perfectly to the place where I was oh, absolutely sure. happy with. So um, there was 12 hours on each blade of, of risk if I ruin it. Be and also, if you if you use the blood for the blood god uh, paint from Citadel, it's very thick. So you're you're if you ruin it, you ruin the whole blade. You have to either scrape it off or get another miniature and paint it again. Right. So I, I try to be very careful with that um this miniature i for sure painted in order to compete with it later um i painted it for golden demon um 
I brought it to, to the Golden Demon in the USA. It got me a commended card, um, and I was absolutely okay with with uh, not placing because the top three were just incredible pieces, and I had, you know, I, I thought maybe uh, my piece was also very good, but I saw that these pieces were amazing. They were bigger as well, which is also important because if you paint, for example, if you can come to judging a squad and you have the same level or very close, but one squad has three miniatures and one is 10, you pick the one that has 10 because it's just more work right. of that standard. So, um, so I really like this piece. It was very hard for me to finish it off because um, I think this is also very common when you put so much effort into a project. The last tiny bit that that uh, finishes the, the the whole piece off is very hard to do because then the piece will be gone. It will be over, and you know, you right. I, I don't like coming back to projects and, and fixing them. So I, I thought, uh, I thought I, I have to add something more. So I've added the banshee on the base as well, the the, the capitated uh, banshee. Uh, you can see the, the the head of it on the back yep, of the base. Yep, I switched to the photo so that that way people can see the head on the back of the base there. Sure. Um, so yeah, it was it was a nice challenge to myself. Uh, and I really wanted to do this this model justice. It was sculpted by uh, one of the best sculptors in the world. You know him very well, probably uh, Darren Latham. Yep. Um, and the last thing I want to say about this piece probably is the fact that when you paint a piece by your um, childhood hero. Oh, okay, I don't want to say childhood because he will be offended and he will say I'm not that old. <laughs> He's not that old. He he has just started painting for heavy metal and sculpting for Citadel when he was, I don't know, six probably. <laughs> so, I mean, um, yeah, he, he uh, without a doubt, is a hero for me. So I wanted to, to make sure that he really likes the, pro the, the, the piece as well. And I think he, he likes it, so I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. <laughs> there you go. You can see again, by the way, just to return back to what we said, you can really see at this 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 angle. I switched it to the one where we can see the Howling Banshee on the back or her head. You can really see the yellows integrating that naturalistic light here as well into the non-metallic of the blade. And I think it just really makes it sell. It feels like it's in real natural lighting. Um, I really like your execution of the non-metallic, uh, especially on the weapons. It, by the way, that timing does not surprise me even in the slightest. Um, on six hours per blade side, that sounds, yep, like that's absolutely. I want to actually use this to just kind of talk about it. When you're, like, your your process, you're a very clean, very precise, very detailed painter. And when you're, when you're working on something like this, like you're working on Drazar or something similar, do you work part by part to completion? So, like, in other words... Okay, uh, now I'm going to do the knee pad. So we're just working the knee pad here, like the right knee pad. I'm going to work this until it's done. And then I'm going to move on to the thigh right above it or, or you know, whatever, right? You, you get what I'm saying? Or do you, like, push some tones over the whole miniature? Or you're like, are you constantly making circles and adjusting, right? Or maybe something else. What's your actual process? Usually, the, the first thing you said, so usually it's just part of her part uh, sometimes when I want to make sure that 100% of the armor for example is done the same I do the, the whole armor but usually because I'm a very I like to paint my competition pieces very meticulously and make sure that everything is perfect even if I divide the armor into four or five sessions I make sure that they every piece looks the same as the previous one so when when it's coming to a competition piece, I, I spend more time and I just paint every single area separately. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. It's funny because I've I've I found myself often using that technique when I'm really trying to achieve sort of as, as you said, like for competition pieces, right? Um, and I wonder and and like, but I but I see other people who don't who I know are also competition painters who don't do that. And so I'm always just fascinated by people's process. Like, and I, I don't think that there's like a right way or wrong way to do it. It's more of just like, how does your brain 
work when it comes to resolving the image, right? And, and, and making the thing look like what's up here getting out there. How does that flow through from your brain down your arm, out your hand, through your brush and out of the paint, right? So I'm always just fascinated by the process of it. Okay. He's gorgeous. Uh, and yeah, I mean, the 40K single, as always, was a was a murderer's row uh, this year, <laughs> for sure. Um, my God. Uh, so... Um, yeah, like those, those three Marines that ended up taking it were all just like mind blowing. Um, and I think by the way, this stood next to them absolutely appropriately. Like it was in, in that finalist of, of commended, I think it absolutely earned its place there. It was right on the level. There's, it was, it's a truly, truly great piece. All right. Speaking of Darren Latham, uh, let's talk about this space wolf. Um, I'm actually going to jump to the frontal, full, the full frontal image, and then I'm going to kind of back my way up. So we're going to look at this guy fully from the front. All right, so we've got our space wolf friend here. Um, he's got his wolfy buddy. Uh, take us through through this one uh, and what you were wanting to accomplish here and, and, and why this piece. So um, I'll, I'll try to give you a bigger story, but very quickly. So I Please. think... That's what this maybe, show is all about. <laughs> uh, maybe in 2018 or 19, there was an interview with uh, Darren on Warhammer TV with Wade Price, uh, where he said, uh, what, he was asked, what is your favorite miniature? And he said, uh, this is a miniature that wasn't released yet. And I uh, messaged him and said, looking forward to seeing your Ragnar. And he was probably, um, he was, you know, um afraid not afraid but um maybe he thought that i knew and i that was just a guess because i remember sure. him saying a few years ago that ragnar is his favorite character of out of the 40k universe so i thought if he has a favorite sculpt it's probably ragnar and the miniature was 20 plus years old at that time so it really needed an update so uh, when it came out, uh, I messaged him and said, "Amazing sculpt!" And uh, I knew it was it was this sculpt. So I thought, "This is an amazing sculpt," but I really, really like uh, stoic miniatures that are imposing, just stemming their uh, already done all of the bad deeds and killing all of the heresy <laughs> and every, everyone that they needed to kill. So I thought, "Okay, I really want to have this miniature painted," but. Uh, I want to make sure that it fits my idea of how, how I want to see him. And also, before that, I was always very afraid of painting Space Wolves. Because, I, as I said, Space Wolves hold a very special place in my heart. So I wanted to, to do them justice when I paint them. But I never could. Even though I, I painted quite well previously, I couldn't... Uh, paint a space wolf to a standard where I was actually happy with it. So I tried it's, again. it's one of the hardest color schemes to resolve of all of these sorts of legions. That baby powder blue is just so hard to get the right amount of depth into, where it, to to still make it look like it is what it is. I absolutely agree. And uh, so this was a special project for me, and I started converting it. I used parts for many miniatures. Uh, the, the legs were from Corsaro Han, from the White Scar miniature. So it was a heavy conversion. I never uh, could do clean conversions as well before that. So I put all of my effort into this last year. And uh, uh, I also wanted to use one of the wolves from uh, Belladonna Volga miniature from yep. uh, Age of Sigmar. Also, probably the best wolves GW ever sculpted. So I really wanted to use them. Um, and Ragnar also always had two wolves next to the, next to him. Um, so I just thought, great, great idea to have them both on, on the base. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of time, uh, a lot of effort, um, a ton of converting, but I was very happy with it. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's my favorite piece out of all the pieces I've done, and might not be the best paint job probably, even though I really like it. But it is a hundred percent my favorite piece. Yeah, what I think is really strong on this piece, honestly. I mean, first of all, it's it's a great capture of the 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 space wolf sort of imagery, theme, iconography, etc. Right, in in the setting 
um, you handled the snow and the ice really well, actually. Um, I find that like it's extremely credible, sort of the way you've got the melt. You have the very small icicles that feel like they're dripping into this, you know, this frozen pond, but it's not absolutely completely frozen like things. There's a little bit of snow melt on the warm rocks, that kind of thing. Uh, the way that you've kind of spread that that out is is really nice. It isn't just like um, cake batter, which is what and a lot of snow that I see people use ends up looking like, right? Um, it just it feels very natural in how that would gather. And on the piece itself, honestly, I think both on the wolf and him, the fur is just handled so well in how you've got it like both on his back and I kind of flipped through some images so that people could kind of see, but like the wolf and the way that you've captured the, the tonal shift around the various parts of the wolf feels extremely naturalistic. Same with the, the, the fur cloak itself and just kind of the fur on him. So I, and I think a lot of people don't integrate those kinds of very almost natural color shifts. And you're moving through some subtle tones here again, integrating a little bit of yellow sepia into that brown, still having the black wall, still having it feel like light is catching the individual strands and so on and so forth. And it's working really well where you've decided to make it a color shift in the fur versus light catch in the fur. So where you've sort of highlighted the darker bits of fur as though it's light passing through the little follicles. And I love, love, love the way you've lined that up with the light on the face and the light in the, the, ponytail hair thingy top knot whatever he has right his his very interesting hairstyle choice i just want by the way this is like a very common hairstyle choice in the 40 in the, in the 41st century apparently i just want everybody to think for a moment if you were walking around in the real world and you saw somebody with this hairstyle like the top knot directly dead center top of their head like a a thing here and then just hair coming out and flowing down the side you would immediately think that person was insane OK, um, but nonetheless, in 40K, it totally works. But I just I love the way the light is catching on the face and the hair and has been caught in the fur like and then on the front, a gorget part of the armor, whatever, for lack of a better term like that, like it just you can absolutely see the shaft of light that's coming down here and where that light is directed and it extends out the the arm on the van brace, down on the knee pad, like you, you've really set that halo of where the light spot is really, really well. Thank you. Well, yeah, I, I, this piece it wasn't so much about realism for me. It was more about making a, a good uh, homage to to space wolves and how they are supposed to look and and have a clean paint job as well. So more towards the heavy metal style, but with some additions like. You said some some um, highlights where the light probably would appear in real life. So, yep, yeah, it just overall sells the composition. It's a really nice to me. It's actually a wonderful marrying of the sort of I don't know what we want to call it, uh, naturalistic style, I guess, and and heavy metal style. It's actually a really nice marrying of the two concepts together, and shows that you can you can make them work in harmony here. Um, really well and I think that's what the piece captures so overall great stuff I have a process question for you though as I am wont to do so this guy this plinth okay let's talk about the plinth for a moment I'm a plinth nerd I'm sorry I love exciting bases and plinths okay did you start with a normal like just standard cylindrical plinth and then cut it to do like some part of a pour of a resin pour there or did you buy one that already had like a chunk out of it and then smooth it down and pour it into it like what what did you do to make this ice like i really find it super credible by the way so i just i'm i'm ultra curious as to as to this process around this one so um i really love the plants as well i have a ton of them ready to to be under some projects some future projects and and my one of the drawers um so for a long time, I had a friend that lived in the forest and it was a uh, basically a guy who worked in, in wood industry. So he did the, the plants for me as a hobby, as a extra uh, way. Now to that's a money. good hookup. That's a good hookup right there. Yeah. Um, and uh, first I, I bought 
just cylindrical plinths and you know I, I used a knife or whatever to carve the, the area for uh, the, the resin but then I thought let's just ask the person that is a professional in this to cut, uh, to, to cut the area that I want to, to have so I asked him to do a couple of those uh, plinths for me uh, with, with the already removed areas of, of the wood nice um, then I have just use the exacto knife to to make the shifts of the area a, a bit more sharp so the the resin doesn't pour her off and then that was it so nice. first I, you know first uh, a few few mistakes a few years ago where i did it myself and then i just ordered some that were already done to the to the you know <laughs> you, you have to remove the stress sometimes from from your work so yeah hey i'm all about it Look, I here's what I'm saying. I don't know if your friend is looking for a change of job or change of career, <laughs> but he should know there is a market of people out here very ready for that kind of a, a, a plinth slash maybe plinth as a service. So, you know, a uh, little, little Paz solution. Um, he's, 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 if he ever gets tired of whatever he's doing right now, boy, oh boy, there's, there's a whole world of miniature nerds out there who would pay him exorbitant amounts of money for his tiny bits of, of, uh, of cut wood. So, you know, he's got career options. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Fantastic. Yeah. This piece is just, is really wonderful. Okay. Uh, go to the last image. What are you doing? Be good. There it is. Okay. So the last one we're going to look at here is the Black Templar. Um, so take us through, are you big Black Templar fan? Uh, you know, what was your, what was your motivation with this one? And, uh, and, and while you're, while you're thinking about that, I just want to say, um, so here, the things that grab my attention right away as well, it should the incredible execution of the sword, uh, love the light catches, love the light, halo sort of effect that you've you've caught on there again seeing that yellow orange integration in there as we can see like almost the reflection of the sun or this light fade um i really really like that quite a bit but it was actually a couple of the small details that caught my eye here um also so i'm sure you're going to talk about the background and i'd love to know about the the stained glass and everything but actually what caught my eye was just like the book that's at his side lots of like the little texture and detail there really finely executed that tell like that gave me the impression of an old religious text that this guy has carried around for a long time you know something that he values greatly some kind of you know an artifact for him and then the the i don't know what the little shield on their chest is called i know it has a name but the the execution of the little shield on his chest and the checkers and the the small insignias and things just so well handled and such a nice just a nice infusion of color right there there's other yellow obviously around the miniature in the non-metallic but it just creates a nice little hot spot right there again of just like visual interest as i'm moving my eye around the piece that isn't overwhelming because of the way you've desaturated it down with the oranges the reds the rust tones so very nice so t tell it take us through the black templar so um, this piece, I really wanted to do a Black Templar piece when uh, they've announced, GW announced that they were going to release some new miniatures. But as it's pretty usual of me that whenever the release coming in two or three months, I cannot wait for it. So I take the available bits out there and I start converting. So I, th I thought, okay, let's grab a few Space Marines, uh, grab some... Uh, old Black Templar bits, some Grey Knight bits, and, and everything like that. And I just built a, a miniature to look like, again, a very stoic, imposing um, uh, war throne veteran of a space marine. Um, my love to Black Templars is probably just based on, on my love towards their aesthetic and their color uh colors in, in in their armor and their uh heraldry and the symbols uh i'm a big history nerd as well so uh, you know the the 
Crusades and, and the Templars weren't that great uh, sure. in real life, but the aesthetics are really nice sometimes. And I can see that you probably have a, a Templar on your back background as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but I really just like the miniatures. So I thought, let's let's do a miniature of a Black Templar before they're actually released. So um, this piece was done very quickly. Um, the, the background with the stained glass was done in a day just because uh, I wanted to have a nice uh, purple background because one of the new artworks uh, by GW has uh, some Black Templars with a purple background and I really yep. like the composition of the colors and how they work together. Um, the icons are just transfers inside of a resin pour, so it's very simple to do. Um, considering the sword, uh, again, I wanted to do a beautiful non-metallic effect inspired by some uh, real-life uh, objects and some uh, work by other artists that I really like. Um, and... Uh, the book, as you said exactly, I wanted to have it very. Um, I wanted to wanted this piece to to scream that it's old, and because, as you say, um, he probably carried it uh, with with him for many hundreds of years, and so it's very um, important, but also very old. Um, and uh, also, it's purple, so it also uh, complements the 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 color composition. Um, and yeah, th this is a, a very cool piece. I I, I think uh, out of all of the, the ones I've done, I think that many things should be different on it. If I would do it now, I might go back and redo it uh, later. But for now, it's it's as it is, and uh, it's it's one of the pieces I, I really like. But I, again, I know it could be a lot better. Sure. Uh, the, the eternal curse. Yeah, absolutely. No, fantastic. Um, so, uh, Yan has a question and we're going to, if people have some questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. Now, um, we're going to do our lightning round questions here in just a moment. Um, but if any people, if anybody has any questions from Mamacon, just put them in there. But Yan asked, um, you love, you say you love imposing static figures. Um, have you done pieces with lots of movement as well? I think certainly Drazar has some good movement. I'll say that. Um, but like what, you know, what are the, what are the things with movement maybe that you've done that you, that you like, as opposed to just sort of the, the static bows? Um, probably the most dynamic piece I've ever done as a duel, um, I've done for the past Golden Demon. It has a Eldar Banshee and a Turin at the Gargoyle. Um, this piece again, um, you can search the, for the picture on my social media. Um, this piece was done with the idea of how the category at Golden Demon works. So the duel has to have two very dynamic miniatures, very well, uh, a very good composition. So I, I had to have two miniatures in very swift movements. And Banshees are known for being very quick and and uh, very deadly. Uh, you know, a Gargoyle is probably the most dynamic turn that you can find. So... Probably that is the most dynamic piece I've done. But if we're talking about pieces that just have a lot of movement that I've done, you can have a look at my diorama that has 40 plus miniatures that are all running at each other. So it's it's pretty much a lifetime worth of dynamism in, in my pieces probably. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, that I would highly recommend. I'm going to put all of Mammoth's socials down in the description. So you'd be able to go follow him, which I highly recommend you do. Go follow him on Insta, everything like that. Um, you've got some great images of your stuff out there. And that diorama is so... I mean, it's insane is the only word I can use for it. Just the, the size of it, the sweep of it, the scope of what's being portrayed there is sort of... Um, it's sort of everything that I would want... <laughs> in in a giant diorama i mean like it's amazing it's i talk a lot about how the pieces that impress me in the diorama category are always the ones that go warhammer is so cool you know like that's what they like if that's what the, the diorama needs wants to like reach out of the glass and grab you by the collars and be like yo isn't warhammer 
fucking awesome. It's awesome, right? Look at this. Look at it. And like, that's what, that's very much what your diorama did, right? Um, is it just slaps you in the face with a Warhammer. Uh, also, I love that you use the tiny, like people should go see it. There's a bunch of small details for people to discover in it. Like you really put a lot of discoverable things into the diorama. Um, but I love that you managed to use the little familiars from Silver Tower in there as well. I've long time love of those guys. They're fantastic little minis. And yeah, so go check it out. All the socials will be down there in the description and you can go hit them up. Okay, so uh, now lightning round. Three questions. This is the lightning round questions that we close on. Okay, so you got to give me the, the rules for this. Are you must give me one and only one answer. No waffling. Okay. No picking multiples, no cheating. You ready? Okay, let's try. Oh, okay, here we go. Question the first. Who is your current favorite miniature painter? They could be living or dead, active or not, but in your mind right now, who is your current favorite miniature painter? Mm. Uh, you're asking me to offend uh, thousands of people. Yes. That right this is now. why this is a tough question. You got to pick the one. Only because you said no waffling, I will answer this question. No, I, I have to add, there's, there's hundreds of people that are amazing. But at this moment in time, the person, uh, okay, short answer, Albert um, Morento, I think, font, uh, Yep. incredible painter just just check him out but there's thousands of amazing painters out yes there. and that's why i always make it one because we know if i asked this question we would all just get out a list and be like right but but there's always one <laughs> and that is a great pick uh because my god so amazing i completely agree like that his his work i want like i seriously wanted to hit him up and be like look if i fly over <laughs> <laughs> and just could you find two days i'll just i'll just watch you paint it doesn't even have to be a class i just want to see you paint like i'm just going to sit there on your shoulder is that possible not literally on your shoulder because that will probably impede the painting um yeah i i agree completely okay nice good pick all right question the second all right what is your favorite color of paint could be a brand could be a specific color. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like it could be just generic color. Green. That's a fair answer. What is your favorite color of paint? You may construe it however you like. Mm, probably, if I think about the best color to work with, for me, uh, it would be Mephist and Red. Uh, just because for years it was very hard to find a very good opaque red paint that is very deep as well and allows you to work with uh either if you're shading or, or if you're highlighting so i would say mephiston red okay it's a very good color i like I like one of the few gw colors i like <laughs> but it makes yeah. it on the list it's one of my like seven i got about seven or eight that's it <laughs> big range uh, technical stuff's fine okay last question what is your favorite type and you again, you may construe the word type, however you like, of miniature. Mm. Stoic imposing miniatures. I'll be boring. I, I said it uh, many times uh, today, but stoic imposing miniatures that tell a story just by being there are my favorite because. That is something I, I know you, you wanted a short answer, but I, I no, no, I'm okay with it. Yeah. Um, when when you have a piece like that and you paint it to a certain standard, it screams that this guy is or or a female uh, is very confident. It's you can see the story in the face. I really like painting faces, so I try to showcase uh, with the highlights how how um the, the, some of the emotions of the miniature and, and stuff like that so i would say stoic imposing miniatures definitely nice um the i mean there's something to be said uh for for miniatures that feel like they're in 
sort of a victory or a survey of what's going on, right? Like they're, they just kind of stand there alone. I think especially when it comes to sort of a single miniature type of capturing an image, it just ends up working really well. Um, you know, when you're, when you are dealing with something like a duel or something, obviously you want that dynamism in there, right? Or, or maybe in a diorama, you have more dynamic poses. because People are going and doing something, but it almost feels more like with a single mini. I mean, you think of like, classical artists so again to return to like you know renaissance or the, the old masters they when when they would do portraits like full portraits of people they were often standing in these sort of singular imposing positions right now like that is to say they weren't like in the middle of you didn't be like ah you know like that's not the that's not usually the way that they they portrayed louis the 14th or something you know like that's not how you you painted the king or whatever right um yeah so i get it completely all right awesome uh well very good uh sir anything else you want to uh leave the audience with here before we before we draw to a close probably two very quick things first of all um if you're uh, if you you want to get better at painting if you're inspired by vince me or whoever you like and in the painting community try to do that because it's an amazing feeling and uh sometimes when i teach classes i can see that someone is tr struggling and i really want to make sure that everyone is feeling good after a class just because i know that sometimes you want to say i will throw my brushes away i cannot paint but if you put the hours in you will become a better painter and you will feel better about my painting. When I just started, I hated my painting. Uh, everyone was telling me how bad I am. And then I thought, okay, I'll try to improve. So that is one thing I want to say. Keep believing in yourself. And uh, if you put the, the hours in, you will be just fine. Um, and the second thing is, I want to thank you all very much for, for having me. I, I want to say that you do amazing things for the community. You do the interviews. You do so many uh, great videos that help people. And I also think uh, what I also believe is some techniques are very hard uh, to, to achieve a, a good result with. But I really like to make them very simple for people when I, again, teach classes. And this is what you do as well with your videos uh, often. And I really appreciate that because sometimes people over uh, make something over complicated and I'm not a fan of this. So thank you very much for being in the community. Thank you for having me. And uh, it's been amazing. Well, thank you very much. That's that's very kind. I really appreciate that. That's certainly the goal. I can't help but echo your first statement, which is that it's the thing I always say, like, there's nothing special about me. I'm not like some kind of born artist or anything like that. So many of the the great miniature painters I know weren't. They were just somebody who came to this hobby like any of the rest of us. And if you put in the time, you put in the practice, you put in the deliberate practice and you, you, you focus and you work on it, you can achieve amazing things with this with this art style. So Mamacon, thank you so much, brother, for coming on the channel. I really appreciate it. I know it's later there. So thank you for spending your evening with me where you are. As I said, uh, all of his socials and everything will be uh, down below. So go give him a follow everywhere. Uh, and uh, yeah, don't forget to hit like, subscribe, do all that fun stuff. Um, hit those buttons. They're real fun. And it helps other people find uh, the channel, find the artist, and get involved. So thank you very much, everyone. Really, really appreciate it. As always, we'll see you next time.